uh, uh, uh. I'm Greg Gardner. <laughs> Thank you. No introduction. Thank you. Um, in summary, <laughs> uh, I want to leave some time for Deborah because I, I do want to hear what she says, and maybe we can get a question or two in. So I'll try not to speak too fast, but I probably will speak really fast. Um, STR is not Walmart or Mattel, a big brand or big retailer, but those are our clients. And in a very quick and general way, we did about 70,000 inspections last year in about 140 countries. Half of those, more than half of those were in China in 28 of 31 provinces. So when the news had everything happening last summer, we got a lot of calls from clients saying, is China okay? Uh, do we have a risk being there? And, and the answer to the question is, uh, yeah, China's fine. Uh, of course China's okay. You have to be in China. Um, but I don't know if you have a risk being there or not because it depends on your product. So unless you, you yourself or you send a company like ours to inspect your factory, I have no idea what your risk is. But China is not the problem. China is, is a fantastic place to source. There's really good factories there, as uh, Director Lee pointed out. And uh, as our results show, there's, there's some bad factories there. Um, some of the worst factories I've been in were, were in Los Angeles, though. And so, <laughs> it, it, you know, I guess to, to make the point, it's not the country. It's not China or any other country. It's the factory. And so you can't say, well, my executive dashboard says, or the broadcast journalist, as we saw yesterday in Bob Eckert's presentation, says, um, the statistics, if you get at your CEO macro level, um, they don't always help you know your supply chain. You actually have to have somebody that goes into your factory, your farm, your field, and lets you know what's happening. Um, do I have one of these? Let me see. I don't want that. I'm going to skip some statistics, and, and I'll tell you why. Because um, Laura and, and Director Lee had some statistics. And I remember what Mark Twain said about um, there's three types of liars. Liars damn liars and statisticians. <laughs> and, and I'm not a statistician, and I'll just skip my statistics because I, I want to hear Deborah. Really quickly, though, um, there, there's two or three ways that you can do uh, some type of testing and uh, uh, ensure the, the quality of your product. You can do uh, a detection method or a prevention method. And detection is just what it sounds like. You go to the end of the field and you pick the tomato, or you go to the end of the production line and you pick the toy and you say, is it OK? Um, and you detect a, a flaw or not. Or you can have a prevention method, which is much more robust. And um, I could talk about some of those things. Some are self-explanatory. Many of you know what they do. Um, but there's things that you can do uh, to know what's happening in your facilities. Um, <coughs> migrant labor in China, how does that have to do with private, um, product safety in China? Uh, if you want to come up afterwards and ask me about uh, the Vietnamese workers we found in factories in China, I'm happy to talk about how this affects your product safety. Um, I, I, in the interest of time, uh, thank you. Last but not least, uh, <laughs> a new member of Committee 100, outstanding lawyer, a partner of uh, one of the country's largest law firm, Gibson, Duns, and Crutcher. Prior to that, she was the first Asian American uh, United States District uh, Attorney General in the Central District of California, that really the top enforcement officer at, at, at the federal level to deal with the kind of issue we're talking about. And more interestingly, she uh, handles the Petford case in recently. So give you Deborah Wong Yang. Thanks, Charlie. Um, I'm going to, I don't think I can go as fast as Greg. <laughs> I can speak quickly, but I just don't think I can rapidly get through that. Um, let me apologize first. When I gave them the slides, there were literally four slides, but they somehow it morphed into 29 slides. So <laughs> I, I'll show you what I'm going to do, but when I start to rapid fire through them, that's, I'm, I'm just eliminating some of what was going on. Um, as Charlie said, when I uh, went into practice about a year ago, one of the things that I do is crisis management. Um, and one of the first crises that uh, appeared before me was the pet food uh, recall. Um, and I wanted to walk you through some of the things that had happened because on the one hand, it's a, a lesson learned. On another hand, with Mr. Lee here today, it dovetails with some of the things that he's had to say, um, and actually also with Laura, um, because you'll see there's a commonality in many of these kinds of things. And it's something for, you know, for us to deal with because I think one of the things is that um, there was a, a lack of messaging. Um, there was certain information, you know, as I was listening to Mr. Lee today explain all the stuff that was going on in China. I will tell you that I saw 
almost none of that. Um, when I was monitoring, monitoring the media for a company, and when I say monitoring, I was having a PR firm look at every single piece of information coming out on the pet food recall on a daily basis and giving me a daily report. So as I was going through that, I actually saw almost none of what it is that was going on in China. So if there's such dearth, uh, there needs to be a cure ultimately because you've got to get that information out to the American public. But let me walk you through some of what was going on here. And it first started, and I only gave you the sort of the, the high-end media, even though the New York Times op-ed section takes slams at me every now and then, I still cite to them. <laughs> but um, uh, it started out in the New York Times. And this, you know, the, by media, it was in everything from like the little gazette in a small town to, you know, mainstream media. And it basically started out in the spring of last year and talked about food safety and how, you know, melamine was being put into uh, the pet foods. Uh, and it was starting to work its way into stories, you know, about dogs and cats and pets in America being um, killed as a result of that. I'm sorry. Hang on. Okay. Um, you start to see this story developing that the filler is sort of an open secret. So now you're starting to see sort of blame assessment going on. That this is something that the media is portraying, you know, to the rest of America. And, I'm, and by my telling you this, I'm not saying I believe in this. This is just I want you to see exactly how the message really starts to get framed out here. That the Chinese have basically been secretly supplementing this cheaper substance called melamine. So it's sort of like, well, the Chinese make cheaper products and that's part of the reason why is because they sort of cheat the system is part of the subtle messaging that's going on in this um, and it's a cheap additive and for those of you who don't know melamine is a stuff that you make like little plastic plates out of but it also manifests itself uh, when you put it into product it looks like a protein so the allegation was that these food products were being sold as being higher protein based but really they were filled with a, a plastic based melamine um, goes on it says many companies buy that melamine scrap to do this it gives quotes from people you know, in China, there's no way for us in the United States to ascertain, you know, we can't get to those people, so there's no way for us to ascertain, was that really the true quote? Is that the whole story? And, you know, you have to remember at the time, from my perspective, we're trying to defend the corporation and trying to keep business going. 